I grow tired of your fatalism, Cain. The lords of monsters, madness, and magic are no more a plague than you, vampire. Now, come, Nosgoth awaits. Welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic podcast. I am Justin, joined by my co-host Jason and eventually Marcus. And this evening we have a very special guest with us, the Soul Reaver himself, Mr. Michael Bell. Michael, how the hell are you? I'm good. Now that I'm out of Nazca, I'm thrilled. Is <laughs> it cold this time of year? Oh, God, really? Absolutely. <laughs> Deadly. So yeah, get my wrap off, but... <laughs> We usually get started by asking our guests if they recall their eureka moment, you know, when you were bit, bitten by the acting bug. Do you have a specific moment in your life you can point to where you decided to take the acting plunge? Gee, you know, I go back as far as, you know, I'm not like one of these, uh, these guys say I was, uh, I was a longshoreman and somebody said you had a nice voice and somebody said you good looking kid and that shit. I was doing it since I was five years old. I wanted to be an actor. Wow. Yeah. It's always trained for it, studied for it. Um, didn't come by it easy and, uh, yeah, absolutely since five. So when did you, did you always have a knack for voices? Were you always just making funny voices around the house? Yeah, I absolutely. Um, uh, but that, this wasn't my, uh, this wasn't my interest. My interest was theater and films and, uh, got to do that. Got to go into contract universal and do all that stuff. And then realized, um, I wasn't going to get an opportunity to play the, uh, the characters I wanted to play uh, while I was on camera. I mean, it was great fun in the beginning and it was still fun, but I didn't get to really play a lot until I got into voiceovers and got to play characters I wouldn't normally play if I was cast, you know, on camera. So yeah, the, always doing voices, always doing characters, always imitating somebody, <laughs> always getting kicked in the ass for doing it. Yeah. <clears throat> so when i read, saw in an interview that that you uh hang on one second here see what happens if I, while we're talking i see someone creep up behind you and strangle you me you yeah what do i do i always think about that when i'm talking to somebody who's a distance away and suddenly somebody comes up from behind them and goes <laughs> and does a thing and puts a bag over their head and what does that person who's in another state do? Who do you call? I don't know. I, I certainly hope. Well, me and Jason kind of live close to each other here, so I, I hope he know. calls him. <laughs> yeah, if it's between yeah, states. Jason's going in the other direction, Justin. <laughs> Justin. <laughs> nah, I'd, I'd call somebody for him. If it's between states, though, <clears throat> yeah. I'd, I'd, I don't know what you do. Call the <laughs> FBI. Isn't that ju their jurisdiction? I don't know. But try to get the, F this is really funny because I was thinking about this sort of great premise for a film. If two people, you know, the guy, the two kids are talking, whatever it is, and somebody sneaks up behind and he thinks it's a joke and somebody literally strangled. And then that character looks into and sees him and he shuts off his zoom and oh shit, he's been seen. And then that's the whole movie is, is that. That's a great way to start a film. Anyway, just off the top of my head. Well, at least uh, you could scream or something just to warn me, and then maybe yeah. I can defend myself. There's that. There's always that. Yeah. I was. Uh, you. I saw that one of your regrets was that you wish you would have pursued Broadway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have any I, roles that you wish you could have done? Maybe some dream roles on Broadway, some performances. You know, I should have studied more. I should have studied singing and dancing more. I became. A, I was a. a I was a, Arthur Murray teacher there's that much and I studied singing a little bit but I, I think I would have loved to have done that on Broadway I'd love to have done musicals but I didn't have the training for it and I didn't stay around long enough in uh, New York which is really what I not that I should have done I mean I, I have no regrets about it other than the fact that it would have certainly been something I would love to have done All right so 
when and, I heard uh, interviews of yours where you um, hold on, you did it in nine, you started in 1956. You've had almost 20 years in the field before you started uh, voice work in 72 here, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, by the way. Started in where? So we you, you started uh, voice work in 72 on Hound Cats, if I'm correct? Oh, yeah, that was for Fritz Freeman, yeah. Okay, so did that start a domino effect for your career? I don't think there was any domino effect. I just, I was fortunate. I came in at a time that there was a very small group of people that were working. I mean, it was Mel Blank and and, uh, and uh, all those guys and Freeze. And I, I was just fortunate. I met somebody who was a sensational voice lady, Joni Gerber, who was just sensational. And we went together. And during that period of time, she said, you're wasting your time doing your on-camera stuff. And I was doing on-camera at the time. She said, you have so many characters inside you, you never can get a chance to do that. So she had me go in and do a session with um, her friend, Mel Blank, and her and his son, Noel Blank. And uh, Noel threw me in the room with Mel, and I got to do a, sort of a commercial with Mel, which wow. was great. And then, uh, I mean, Mel Blank. Yeah, that's a story. That's a, you know. Whoa. And, uh, and Noel said, uh, Dad, uh, I want you to play an East Indian character and Michael, you play this young guy buying a carpet or something. It was some product. And we started it and then he said, no, no, dad, you, you're doing an Indian. I want an East Indian. And they started again and he said, no, no, dad, it's it. Okay, Mike, do you do East Indian by any chance? And I do. <laughs> I looked at Mel and he said, go, go, boy, chick. Yeah, you do it. No problem. Play the other character. And I went, okay. And I did that. And I came home. And I said, I beat out Mel Blank. No blank. I did something no blank couldn't do. There was the one thing in the world that he couldn't do that I was able to do. Not that I could do his other stuff, but I could do that. And how exciting that was. And uh, and then got to work with him, of course, in the speed buggy after that. That is that's quite a claim of fame. <laughs> so are you doing much from home now due to the pandemic? <clears throat> no. Um a little ADR, but for the most part, zip. You know, I'm I'm at a stage in my life where uh, a lot of youngins are out there, you know, and audition. But a lot of young people, a lot of young honchos, a lot of Turks coming up behind me. I do a lot of teaching, uh, but I have been doing some ADR for Netflix, for foreign films, pretty much. Uh, and what's interesting is I don't perceive myself having a voice that could be considered an old guy, but uh, I get stuff to read that for 70 and 80 year olds. <laughs> I, you know, I'm a little confused by that. I wonder, <laughs> okay, you want me to sound like this? Should I uh, be somewhere in here? I said, no, do your voice. I said, my voice doesn't sound like I said, I don't even sound like my balls dropped, for Christ's sake. <laughs> I'm like an 80-year-old guy. But all right, fine. Great. Uh, your words, not mine. Yeah, I know. <laughs> do you see uh, having a home studio being a necessity for future voice actors? Always, it's uh, uh, yeah. Always since the, even way before the pandemic, obviously. I mean, I have a whisper booth behind me and with the mic, etc. I send my auditions that way, because traveling was hell going into the agency and then, you know, then recording and having to head on home over the freeway was always a pain in the ass. Yeah, I, I right. think it's great. I don't have any of the equipment that, like, uh, like Bob Bergen has or my other buddies. I don't. I just never really invested in any of that. Right. So we had Larry Kenny on recently and sure, he was right. he was detailing the differences between recording now which can be done from home, separate booths or you may even have motion capture. And mm -hmm. as opposed to recording in the 80s when uh you got a show like ThunderCats was recorded by five people in the same room. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask if you kind of miss that personal group aspect of the work with everyone kind of being in the same room and building off of each other. It was like a party. It was like you invited to a party you got paid for. <laughs> Absolutely. Great fun. Um, we did the Smurfs, um, Transformers, G.I. Joe, all those shows were done that way. And I think then suddenly we started to compartmentalize it. And then they said, Mike, you're coming in, but everybody else will be showing up in, in division because they all have other jobs. And before you know, it, we were working by ourselves. It's kind of like, um, I call it vocal baiting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just, it's, it's, you just, by yourself getting off it's just goofy 
Do you think that's that's hurt the work a little? I don't know if it's hurt the work. I don't know if anybody notices. I really don't. You do you do three two or three takes and you do it, you know, and then you send right. it in. And I think it takes I don't know if there's joy being taken out of it or not. I don't know. And now of course with the pandemic, you're not going into a studio anyway to do it by yourself. So it's hard to say. I don't know. I think Justin dozed off in the middle of my conversation. Oh, it looks like he's having some connection issues. Let me shoot him a message real quick okay. and we can keep going while he's that's. Uh, I thought I put him to sleep. Oh, no, it's it are his connection. He kind of lives out in the sticks. It's not the greatest. So, oh, OK. All right. But uh, while he reconnects. Yeah. Um, what kind of pointers did Amy Hennig give you, if any at all, for direction in your portrayal of Raziel? Oh, she was wonderful. She and uh, and our director. Um, I mean, they, they, it was it was it was really cool. I, they they just knew what they wanted, and I was I was surprised since there were so many Brits in uh, in Hollywood at that point. I thought, well, I, how do I stand a chance playing a, a Brit? Because <laughs> Raziel is English, obviously. And she said, no, it's what I want. It's the sound I want. And uh, she was just there to guide me. You know, it's, I don't know if there were pointers, just he was there, she was there to guide me. She, I think what was great as, as, um, as a producer, and I'm sure she had a lot of input uh, with, uh, with our director. I think that uh, she let the actor be, let the actor do what the actor was gonna do. That's yes. always really good. We had Simon Templeman on, and he had nothing but good things to say about her. So, yeah, Simon's cool. I like Simon. Yeah, he was, he was a <laughs> really, phenomenal guest. Really talented. Really talented guy. Very talented guy. I was going to ask back. you. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's okay. I thought you fell asleep. Your eyes were closed when you froze. I went, oh, my God, I put you to sleep. <laughs> he dozed sorry, off. We live in India first time. <laughs> I had some technical difficulties on my end. Okay. What were your first impressions of Simon upon meeting him? Oh, I just said he was so cool. You know, and the cast was good. It was a cool cast, but Simon was really cool. I mean, the minute that voice popped up, I said, oh, this is going to be fun. That's, that's the fun of working with somebody so you get something from them. All actors will tell you that. You, you, it just, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a, when you're by yourself, you're on a seesaw. So you wind up, sitting down and then you run to the other side, then you sit down, you run to the other side and you sit down and you know, the effect is a little bit different. Where somebody's working with you, it's so cool. It's really great. No, he's, 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 he's super. I mean, you guys are the main characters of that series, obviously. A lot of the tension and dialogue is built around the relationship between you two. So as you guys were worked together over more and more games, it was did switching into Rosie Ellen Kane become muscle memory almost? It always is. By that time, yeah, by that time it is. I think it's, it was a mini series and we didn't do a hell of a lot, but I had hoped it, it would go a little further than it did. I think so did the fans, judging by the fans that I've met um, on the conventions. I was so surprised that people said, oh my God, Raziel. There were people that stood in front of me that cried and mm -hmm. said, oh, it's you. Oh my God, it's you. I can't stand this. God, don't pass out. Do you... <laughs> Here, take a toke. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, I saw that you said several months ago that you weren't reprising any of your Rugrats role, but I just saw that you were credited as Chaz Andrew. Did that change recently? No, not at all. Oh, okay. So they're no, just... I saw that too. And I also saw that uh, there's some other people that were in it that are not in it. No, uh, they made the decision. I heard from my agent months later and she called me up. I said, what's going? I hear it's going. She said, yeah, it's going, it's going. And finally she called me. She said, they're, they're, uh, they're going with a lot of young people. And that's uh, okay too. I just didn't want anybody playing my role. So I have no idea what the scripts are about. I know Kath is in it and E.G. Daly, I know, and maybe Tress, I don't know. Tress is busy doing Animaniacs. So, but I don't know what adults are in it. I, I was under the impression they said, that's okay. We love Mike. We love Mike and we're gonna, we're gonna find something for him to do. 
Yeah, right. Sure. They'll find something for me to do. Uh-huh. So they're they're just crediting you in it and there's actually I have no idea. I, I, I don't know who put who posted that at all. I, I don't I don't buy it. I don't see it. I really don't. Not unless they bring Chaz back or Grandpa Boris. And I know they're not gonna bring back Grandpa Boris. And I don't know if they'll bring back Chaz. I, I don't have a clue. I really don't know. It'd be nice, but uh... Well, uh do you know the behind the scene extras that were included on the the video games that's that was one of the first times fans got a look at the voices behind the characters that they love in the game yeah yeah and those have become iconic you know those are on youtube people i remember watching those over and over again uh so when you're in that moment is there a pulse that you have your finger on that you can tell things are going well and that this is gaining some popularity you know, you really don't know. I've done so many games. So the people remind me of a game I've done, I don't even recall, and, and, and games I thought were wonderful, really, really super dialogue, wonderful characters, and nothing, nothing happened. And then suddenly you get the success of something like this, which really took off. I mean, this, for me, this was even more than Ratchet and Clank, which I've done, you know, which people, some people remember, obviously, but this was, this was the quintessential game for me in terms of popularity. Mm -hmm. Would you say that your work on Legacy of Cain is the work that resonates with the most with you? I don't know if it resonates the most with me. When you say resonates, I'm not sure. You know, Jason, when you work on a show uh, or a game particularly, it's done segmented. So it's not as if you're doing a TV series where you, you're with the cast every day for two weeks, three weeks, whatever it is. and so much is happening. You're there for a day or a day and a half, and that's about it. And it's just so much dialogue that you have to cover within the framework of that day. And uh, it's just, um, it doesn't stay, none of it stayed with me. I mean, I did it, and then here's the thing, and I don't know, oh, we got someone, Marcus, he's just joining us, and he's swigging <laughs> what looks like vodka. Um, <laughs> good evening, Michael, how are you? Sorry for good the evening. Uh, I, I I never played games. Uh, I'm just, it's not my milieu. It's just something I'd rather read a book. So uh, Amy said, I'm going to give you, we have finished it. I'm going to give you uh, the uh, Soul Reaver and I'm going to give you a PlayStation. And I thought, wow, that's lovely. Oh, I didn't even know what that was. And so I took it home and my daughter helped me hook it up. I think she was just born and uh, and didn't even, she, I think she crawled over and hooked it up because I didn't know how to do any of it. As an adult, only babies know how to do that. Anybody under one knows how to do it. And so she hooked it up for me and uh, about, oh, I don't know, I don't know what it was. And she came in later on and she said, dad, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get Raziel on the, on the second hook. There's like a clip and you have to get him on that clip and I can't get him up on the clip. She said, dad, that's just the beginning of the game. I said, yeah, well, I just started. She said, you've been here for four hours. Four hours, I couldn't even get the game started. And because I, I wanted to get to the, to the video, I wanted to get to the visual. And you just can't jump to the visual, you've got to play the game. So I wrapped it up, tied it up nicely and gave it to some kid who desperately needed games and didn't have a PlayStation. I gave it to him and his mother I said, here, take it up to the Ozarks, have a wonderful time. <laughs> <laughs> Years later, of course, now I can go to YouTube and see what it was I did, right. and see how wonderful the cast is, and how you know how cool it looks, and the effects, and, and the dynamics of it. Really, it's a beautiful game. I don't know anything about the game other than it looks good. So when I go to conventions and and people who are really into Raziel and the game will say, "Do you remember when?" and they will describe the situation, and I go. I, you know, you're going to have to get a life because I haven't got a clue. I've never <laughs> Are you a shut in? Because I have no idea. You want me to remember something from the game that my character, when they killed a particular, I played some of the characters that they killed. I played other characters that, because you, know, you have you get give them three voices. You, get, you have to have three voices. So it was me and then two others or whoever came along that they didn't have another actor for. So who remembers that? Marcus, you just got in here. We've been talking. Go ahead and get in there. Um, again, good evening, Michael. And again, like I said, apologies for the tardiness. It's okay. Um, 
I want to know, uh, how did you initially get introduced to the role of Raziel? Well, they called me up and uh, brought me in and said, we'd love you to read for this. It's pretty much, uh, it's very rare that anybody just gives anything to you in this business, at least now. I used to, they used to do that, but then after a while, everybody else had something to say. You have a committee that makes the decision. So the whole committee has to make the decision. So I think Amy had a lot to do with it and, uh, and said, yeah, that's the voice I want. That's because I didn't know Amy before that. We had never met. And he said, she said, that's what I want. And the fact that he was a, a Brit was great fun for me because it was an opportunity to really go out and work outside the box. And did you do anything specific to prepare for that role initially or once the sequel started spawning? You know, you, you don't have to, you really don't. Once, you, once I was in the character and they had the sequel, I said, yeah, I know who he is. You know? no, matter what he, no matter what confronts him, no matter what happens to him, I know I, I'm in there. And I'm also I'm in very capable hands because he's a good writer. He's a wonderful mm. writer. So it's, uh, I just, you just dive in. As an actor, you just dive in. You really can't prepare too much in advance for a game. It's very difficult to prepare for a game because they keep changing it. So you, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, you spoke about, um, just briefly before, about how fans will come up to you at conventions. Are you kind of surprised at all, like how fans kind of hold this game in such high regard, like almost 20, yeah, I believe 20 or 30 years after it's come out? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, in the first couple of conventions, I didn't even have any photos available. And when I came back to LA, I said, I, I gotta get some photos of, of Raziel. And then I, I spoke to the artists and they, they sent me prototype etchings and drawings of them when they first started. So I have those. I have a lot of etchings as well as some wonderful stuff. And then one artist came, artist came up and he did a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. Uh, and I had that reproduced. And those all go at the conventions. I mean, I'm always surprised when somebody comes up and says, you were Raziel. It's, it's bizarre because it never occurred to me because it's not as if they come up and mention any other game. Maybe, maybe one character from Ratchet and Clank, but that's about it. It's all Raziel. Okay. Um, it's kind of the last legacy of Kane question. Can you give us maybe your fondest memory of working with Tony J or most memorable moment? Tony, Tony, rest in peace, Tony. I'm sure he's got, he's, he's probably talking God's ear off. Uh, I directed Tony in uh, Peter Pan for Fox. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And he was one of my pirates uh, with uh, Tim Curry played Captain Hook and Jason Marsden was Peter Pan. And I had about 12 kids and Tony J. Oh God, Tony is impossible. I love them dearly and marvelous, marvelous voice. He kept coming up to me saying, you know, I'm, I'm really much better for Captain. You understand I'm much better for the Captain. I'm really Captain Hook. I should be much better for Captain Hook. But I don't think he's doing it right. I said, Tony, just do your part. You, you know, you, you're wonderful at what you do. Yes, but I, as Captain Hook, I should be, I mean, that was constant. And then and we, he was so, that's, that was Tony. Then we saw each other, of course, and, and I was so glad to see him in, uh, in the Soul Reaper. Okay. Um, if possible, could you give us a life experience that was most helpful in shaping your craft? Well, you know, I, I, it's hard to say. If, in terms of the craft, I haven't done anything really major, I think, as an actor, as certain actors can say that they've done. I, I'm basically, because I've been a voice of cartoons, mm -hmm. and it's so in and out and quick, and it's already in and of itself what they give you. There's no time to research. There's no time to dig deep to say, this is what something in my life that, that has moved me to do this right. I think uh, certainly, in, certainly not in the case of uh, a game like this, because this, obviously, I've met monsters, but not with the monsters I've met in Nazgoth. Uh, <laughs> I think the best part is being a hero. I think that, because uh, in, in life, I don't know how, how heroic we are in life, but that's always fun to be a hero in, in, uh, in, in games, especially in animation, of course. But I don't think there's anything that prepared me for this. I'm really not sure there's anything that prepared me for this. 
Um, okay, switching gears, what is a normal day in the life of Michael Bell like? And to kind of make it interesting, let's say pre-COVID and post-COVID. Well, post-COVID, between naps, uh, <laughs> I'm up and about uh, feeding five cats, three dogs, um, teaching voice animation. I have a Zoom class. I teach voice animation. And uh, starting early in the morning, it's uh, getting everybody fed and uh, picking up poop, cleaning out litter. Uh, it's very exciting, very Hollywood. <laughs> and uh, what are we gonna have for dinner? I'm vegan, so I have to figure what the hell I'm gonna have because I've got a limited menu. So we have to figure what my, my wife will always say, oh, I don't know what to make for dinner. What do you suggest? So we gotta rummage around and see what the hell I'm gonna have for dinner. Um, staying on top of um, pre, pre-pandemic, staying on top of my daughter's career, who's a successful actress, director and producer. And, just talking about her all the time, which is my joy, and uh, working in uh, animal welfare issues, and now, um, and political issues and environmental issues. I keep very busy doing that. That's pretty much my days. It's they're not as varied as I'd like them to be, but pre, pre-pandemic, I'd go to the theater a lot. Love the Groundlings, which you wouldn't know is a, an improv group out here, great improv group that my wife is one of the founders of. And, uh, sensational actors and comedians are uh, our, uh, uh, graduates. So, so we go and spend time with them. That's it. It's, it's a, it ain't Hollywood. I'm not going to parties, you know, not anymore. I won't tell you what I did before I got married because I don't think this is, uh, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think your audience is ready for it and I could get arrested. <laughs> okay. Um, and last question, um, you've, You've been with us for a long time. You're 80, 82 years old, correct? Yep, sure. Am. Count, not and, cut me in half and count the rings. <laughs> and you've seen our world and lives change multiple times with technology yep. advancing. Did you ever believe it would get to this point? And do you think it's too much? You know, I, you know it's an interesting question. That's really interesting. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, it is a, it is a, Wow. I don't know if it's too much. I think it's, we don't know what to do with most of it. I think that it's also interesting that it's here, but when you think something as simple as keeping the earth clean and keeping our wildlife and, and our environmental, our environment safe and water clean and air clean, we're so busy doing other things. Um, and we can do that. We can do all of that. And you, you pick up uh, any one of these brochures that you get, there's all these gigars that people have invented. You go, look at this fantastic thing, all this time spent on that. And, and yet we're not really working on something that we could easily take care of. Mm-hmm. I know we could handle most of the problems that the world faces, but we're humans. We're, the, um, we're, the, uh, we're both on two levels. We're both the, uh, the gods and the enemies of our world, unfortunately. Hmm. It's really kind of sad. Indeed. Well but said. Zooming, when people say Zoom, I, oh my God, Zoom. You know how long it took me to figure out what the hell that was all about? <laughs> you know, I haven't got a clue. I'm still trying to figure out how the, how the turntable works. How come that <laughs> plastic makes music? How come my phone knows where I am? I mean, and, and when, I first, uh, when I first got on the computer and I can tell, is this closed circuit? When, when I first got on the computer and a friend said, you've got to get a computer. And I didn't want to be bothered. And they finally he gave me his old computer and I pushed it and he said, you know, this is what you do. And he showed me how to do it. Real simple. It was very simple. It was like driving into a Model T Ford. It was an old computer. And I typed in, he said, you can get anything you want. So I typed in naked people, just as a joke. <laughs> naked people. <laughs> and I went, oh my God. And I called my wife, I said, you know, look at this. Look what's on my computer. And I began to type in terrible stuff like terrible stuff like naked dwarfs and naked dwarfs came up. And I said, old people screwing. And old people screwing. <laughs> oh my God. This this is what is this? What is this I'm looking at? After a while, of course it was boring. But in the beginning, I thought, is there nothing that I can find? And sadly, there was nothing that I couldn't find. And after a while, I wasn't interested because there was some horrible stuff popped up. I said, I don't want to see that. So that's what's so interesting is that all of that 
was so amazing to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, I was fascinated. And of course, it has to stop being fascinating in terms of the new stuff that comes up, but I don't keep up with it. It's like if somebody, my daughter wants me to get a new car and I say, I wouldn't know how to drive it because unless all it had to brake, gas, a radio and, and headlights, I'm fine. But all the rest of that digital stuff, I would never know what to do with it. Yeah. I would be stuck. Yeah, I um I always like to ask. Uh, I'm I'm blessed to still have a few people around your age in my life that have uh, been born around the time you are, and I always want to ask them that question, you know, because they've literally seen the like I said, the world change in front of our eyes, just mm-hmm. like from refrigerators, running running toilets, uh, color televisions, and to to think that yes, I was there. I was there. The first TV set in Brooklyn when I was a kid was eight inches, an eight inch TV set. And they had they had a test pattern on it. And when it came on, it was a test pattern of an American Indian with all kinds of dots and radiation around. And I'd sit there like a bunch of schmucky kids staring at that test pattern. It was fascinating. Just look at the test pattern. And then on came Howdy Doody, which was a puppet show. We were knocked out to be in the peanut gallery and had to go down to the Radio City Musical to be in the peanut gallery for Howdy Doody would have been extraordinary to see all of that. I mean, I was a radio kid. I used to listen to the radio. Now I'm watching this. How unbelievable to watch. And then it would go off the air at a certain time. I mean, it hit like 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock and that was it. There was no more shows. I mean, think about it. Think about how all of that. You look back at that now and you go, oh my God, how fascinating how far we've come with that. Oh yeah. I think about movies. I thought, what if you took Jurassic Park and you took it down to the back into the 20s or the 30s as the first movie ever seen? Can you imagine audiences sitting there watching that <laughs> foot come up and everything? <laughs> they'd be heading out. They'd be heading out. There. People ran out the doors when when uh, there were certain, certain movies that I saw that were horror films. People were running out there because it looked real. You don't remember because you're kids, but we had a thing called smell vision You'd go to the theater and they had the seats equipped. And if the murder murderer was in the room, they s- said earlier that he wore a certain cologne. And we never saw who, we had all these people and also you'd smell the cologne. We go, oh my God, the killer's in the room. And it squirted out from under the seats. And it was called Smellorama. I'm serious. I'd like, like to make a return to- of that. That's yeah, yeah, that, that sounds, sounds cool. very interesting. Yeah, that sounds awesome there, actually. Then there was the tingler. The tingler was the murderer. And when the murderer came and he, it was like, they electrified your seat and you'd sit in the theater and you suddenly go, you know, what the hell? And you knew that the killer was in the room. It was the tingler. Think about it. Those were all the beginning of all that craziness. I guess the less you can do on screen, the more you can do for the audience actually watching the movie, you know? All this stuff. But with Smell the Rama made me laugh because they started out with the documentary. First you smell roses and then there's something else came up and then something else came up. And then there was really a gross one. I think it was people were getting tested there they were getting some sort of test from their feet and you smell feet you went what the hell i mean they had all that stuff screwing up under your seat or somewhere somewhere in the theater squirted out i don't recall but that was and people rushed to see smellorama i think i would too of course how unusual <laughs> are you kidding me oh my god i mean seeing a horror movie that would add an extra element like tingling like when a scene comes up or the killer comes up that sounds awesome actually and it was it was called the tingler you can look it up i think you can google it the tingler the movie i think vincent price might have been all those things vincent price might have been in it i don't know uh, it's just it's just so funny i mean when you look back on that it probably would go big now if you could get into a theater but that was, yeah, yeah. That was, we had shows you how the different, what everything they tried to make. And then, of course, there was 3D, and we all went through the 3D period, all of that stuff. Yeah. We saw that. Jason? Yeah. I uh, have, uh, as an actor, what are some recent performances that you've seen that you appreciate the most? Well, there's, there's been so many. Uh, when you say performances, uh, actors, uh, I'm a big Tom Hardy fan. Ooh. I think he's just <laughs> sensational. And um, most of the ladies, of course, you know, Meryl Streep goes without saying. She's just one of the finest there is. Um, 
recently saw a film called uh, A Promising Young Woman, which will be coming out in Christmas. Some excellent performances by young people. Excellent performances. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of good work. I really am. I love, uh, I love, I love movies. That's why that's was a big attraction. I'd love to have been in something important. I've been in films, but nothing really important. <laughs> I'm in an underground film, which is so horrendous, called Damaged Goods, and in it I get clap. <laughs> and I did it, if I did, it was one of my first movies, and I did it for $100 a week, in, and it was on 16 millimeter, and it became eventually 35 millimeter. It is so bad, it's good. I'll have I to have check that out. one out. Yeah, definitely. It's damaged goods. And I am so goofy in it and so silly. And I thought, why would anybody hire me after I looked at that? But I was lucky. What can I tell you? <laughs> so what were some of your favorite films growing up? Growing up? Oh, yeah. got, uh, The High and the Mighty, um, Written on the Wind. Uh, those old dramatic films of when I was a kid. Bambi, good God. And recently I was at a convention and I met the voice of Bambi. He's a guy my age. And he was sitting with his wife and I walked over and I saw the Bambi things. I said, and, and you are, he told me. And, and I said, and what did you say? And his wife said, he was the voice of Bambi. I said, oh my God. And I got <laughs> excited about meeting him as the fans are excited about meeting me. I said, I grew up, and I said the same thing. I grew up with you. Well, he was a kid at the same time. I didn't grow up with him. He was also a kid. <laughs> and we talked about Disney and then I met um, on a convention, on a, two conventions, um, the, the, the gal who's like 90 something now and, and moves very slowly. And we spent, we had dinner with a group of friends uh, who was Tinkerbell. She was the design for Tinkerbell. And she was hot when she was young. She has photos of herself in a bathing suit. She was hot. And I said to her, we're sitting at dinner. And she's an old gal, she's real quite old now. And I said to her, so the truth, come on, we're sitting here, we're having dinner. So uh, you and Walt, you know? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you and Walt? Mm -hmm. She said, I'm not telling. I mean, I my, these, this is my era, you know, and, and those people. I did a film called Blue, working with Ricardo Montalban, who was just sensational. I, mean, I knew him since I was a kid. He was this movie star, and then we're working together. With, he's teaching me how to play pool. I mean, these are all the gifts of that period for me. I've heard your story about uh, Michael Bay and how the Transformers conversations went down. Yeah. For people that may not know, can you just tell us why you weren't involved and how that <laughs> kind of how that how those conversations went? Good Lord, Michael, I forgot the guy's name, Santos, or Ray, or whatever the hell his name was. I heard him on the radio saying, we're doing the Transformers, the movie. I thought, oh, okay, live action, whoa. Hey, we're going to have to do some voiceovers in there, okay. And he said, we want to use as many of the original voices as we can get. I said, oh, great, call my agent. I said, let's get on it. She got me a number, and I contacted him, and I said, hey, Michael Bell. He said, oh, Michael, my God, I'm such a fan, prowl and blah, 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 and he goes into the whole big thing. And I said, is there going to be anything in there for me? Because I don't normally do this. I leave it up to the agent. But I really would like to have done that. And he said, well, Prowl's not going to be in it. I said, well, I'll do several other voices. And none of them are going to be in it. I went, oh, darn. What if you get Jack Angel, myself, Dan Gilberson, and I know all the guys we keep contact, Neil Ross, and everybody. What if you have us on camera? What if we are subsidiary characters, sort of like uh, glorified extras. I mean, I can be a guy sitting on a bench and say, look at the size of that thing, or whatever. And somebody else is selling, selling newspapers, and he goes, oh, and, like, and all of us, because we're all actors, we could do extra work, and then you would have the old man in the street, blah, 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 all the way down the line. We'd even bring in, you know, Mary McDonald Lewis, or, you know, and Sue Blue. We'd bring in people that, that were voices, etc. cetera. And uh, he said, oh, no. I said, okay, <laughs> end of story, nice talking to you. That's it. That was it, no, <laughs> thanks, Mike, no. I said, you gotta use extras, You got, and we don't do extra work, none of us do extra work, but you've gotta use performers, you've gotta use background performers, they're gonna have to be in there anyway, so you might as well, yes, we all have our cards, and you can point us out, he said, yeah, no. <laughs> and it's stupid, wouldn't you think that'd be interesting for the fans to go, that was Jack Angel, 
that was Michael Bill. That was Dan Gilvezin. Oh my God, look who that was. That was me and go down the line. Absolutely. It'd be so easy to do too. Yeah, because we all have sad cards. I mean, it's it's crazy. So look, anyway, I, I didn't go see the movies. The, I saw a clip of one. I said, it's so loud. And I don't know who any of those characters are. There's just a lot of <laughs> big voices. Blah, 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 and all that stuff. And the one I did like, I got to be honest, I did like the um, Bumblebee. I thought that was a charming film. The one with Bumblebee. I like that. I'm sorry Dan didn't do the voice. I don't know why they used anybody else because he's he's still right on nose. But uh, they needed a movie star. So I have not seen Bumblebee, but I have heard people say that they like that movie. It was charming, and I but I didn't like the others. I mean, I saw just clips of the others, and I thought they were uh, just a lot. Again, as you talk about the modern world, I just think they modern out. They they lost the the heart of the characters. Uh, I know people had said to me when Prowl died, kids were crying in the audience. Mm. Prowl died in this, and it's because you you're attuned to those characters, you get to feel because those characters make sense to you. But who's going to die for a big piece of metal? You know, that's, that has no personality. So, All right. Yeah, I agree. I, I feel like um, even as enjoying the Transformers series, um, those movies. I mean, I know they're action movies, but it's kind of like sensory overload a little bit. It is. It's an overload. It's like too much of a good thing. You can do so much. Listen, when it's done well, then you you truly enjoy it. I, I love the Planet of the Apes films. I thought they were all done well in the most. All of great movies. Great films, and the one the, the fight for the fight for the planet or whatever fight for the Planet of the Apes was beautiful characters, beautiful voices, really well done. You really got caught up in the characters. Other than just having apes fighting humans, you know, that never makes any sense to me. Yeah. My main issue with those Transformers films is the Transformers almost feel like extras to the human story. They are. Yeah, it's it's Shia LaBeouf and 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 the Babe, and that was pretty much it. You, it was just and a lot of a lot of big giant can openers running around the place. <laughs> right. Was, they could do it, so they did it. You know, it didn't. It didn't. Uh, it didn't have the feeling that Av Avatar had, and that was magnificent. Yeah, I saw that several times in theaters. That was just a visual experience. That was just, and you had characters that were interesting, and you cared about them. You didn't want to see anybody die, you know, was, you know, the, you know and even in some animated stuff. I mean, we saw the animated, the recent, most recent Lion King, beautifully done, beautiful characters. Really, to make you, they, it's not just saying, hey, that's good animation. It was really well done. But again, it's uh, sometimes it's too much of a good thing. I don't know. It's that modern. It's not, as long as we can do it, let's do it. But let's forget about the humanity of the characters. So, indeed, I uh, know Peter Cullen was involved in those films. Do, do you have any contact with him, or did any conversations with I him see about Pete those? Every now and then. I see him on a con I, when we be doing conventions. I saw Pete. I see Frank. Uh, I was glad to hear that Frank got what he got, and Pete and Peter, and I think. Uh, I think Charlie Adler got a got a chance to play with them and some of the other guys, not the guys who were the originals in, in the series, but we got to use them for their voices. Um, I ran into Peter and Frank at one of the conventions I was at, and I walked over. But I, Peter and I worked together on the Voltron Defender of the Universe, so uh, we became very friendly. So I walked up behind him; he didn't see me. He was posing with people for big bucks, and I walked up behind him; he didn't see me, and I put both my hands on his on his butt. <laughs> and he went, whoa, boy! <laughs> uh, one of the fans was grabbing a handful. <laughs> but Michael, <laughs> oh, oh, God! <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. So, in, uh, what are some of your favorite movie snacks? Movie what? Movie snacks. What do you like to eat while you're watching movies? Popcorn. Popcorn. Is there anything better than popcorn? No. Oh, that and chocolate covered almonds. That's, that's a good combination. Two biggies. I don't want anything that's going to squish under my foot. It's, I don't want anything too sweet that's going to stick in my teeth. No, popcorn and chocolate covered almonds. That's it. And I don't drink, I don't drink uh, sweet drinks. So I don't drink Coke or Pepsi or that stuff. It's, it's not good for you. So. But popcorn, anytime. In fact, we're going to have popcorn tonight. <laughs> like something to lighten that popcorn. Yeah. 
going to back up on this a little bit since we talked about Tony J. Simon hinted last time he was here that there may be some R-rated, more R-rated Tony J. stories floating around out there that he would tell next time. Do you, do you happen to know what he's talking about? I t- about Tony? Yeah. Gee, no. I know Tony was married and uh, then got really successful. And what happens is sometimes when you become the big star, you realize that your mate is wrong for you. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm a star, I shouldn't be lied to you. And you find someone young and pretty. And uh, I said, that's terrible. She may be watching this. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're safe. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a kid and they were introduced him to his little kid. He's finding he's an old daddy and he had a little kid. It's, but that's all, I didn't know anything else about Tony. I can't think, I don't want to think of Tony in anything adult, like an adult film. <laughs> <laughs> I had the same reaction, so I guess I'm just going to have to pester Simon until he spills the beans. Please do. I, I wouldn't be able to get that picture out of my head. <laughs> I ran into uh, Rene Abagenois, um, obviously, uh, several months ago, and uh, we talked a little bit. He, he, it's like he, he went out on the conventions. He wasn't really what he was there for. Some, what, what is it they want to what, what are they doing? I said, come on, Rene, you're signing your Star Trek crap. You know, <laughs> silly. And then people will come over and remind him of, uh, he said, what was the character I played on, uh, he said, on uh, Soul Reaver, because they asked me about it. He said, well, you've done so much stuff. I can understand that. I get it. Right. Sure. Yeah. And I have no idea because I can't remember the character I played. So leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> At what point did you become aware of Raziel's popularity yourself? With the, with the, um, basically just before the conventions, I think, um, I th- think Annie called me and she said, there's a guy who wants to meet you in um, Santa Monica and he has some memorabilia he'd love you to sign and he's a huge fan and she's I've been communicating with him and I don't know if you want to do that. I said, sure, because it was also a favor to her because I know that she was interested. And I said, but I don't have to go to his room or anything, do I? I mean, not a hotel, cause I'm not going to do that. I mean, I don't know if... if Two big guys hold me and do something awful to Soul Reaver. <laughs> so, uh, I did a name in the restaurant. We sat and we shot the breeze and he was so thrilled. And, and I finally got a feeling as well. That's, he really was caught up in it. And then, and then wow, it was like gangbusters at the, at the conventions. Absolute gangbusters. Really surprised. So we've had several voice actors on and a good many of them mentioned how they find the process uh, therapeutic in a way, how you can transfer some of your own excitement and anger and just your emotions into the character. Is Do you have similar results with your work? No, I do that at home. <laughs> I know I have my wife's on the floor. I told you to stop it. I have to hit you again. <laughs> I'm on the phone. I'm on Zooming. I'm Zooming. <laughs> That's impossible. <laughs> No, I don't, I don't need that. I don't, I don't, I'm angry enough at home. I have to get angry in front of a camera or behind a mic. But it is fun. <laughs> it is fun. You know, yelling and screaming at characters and threatening to kill people and getting killed. It's, but I, don't forget, I teach voice animation, so I teach people how to die. Several ways to die if you're in a video game. That's always fun to look at their face. <laughs> what would you say are the biggest differences between uh, voice acting in the 70s and 80s and uh, currently? Oh, we had to slow down during the 70s and 80s. When you did things, it was over-articulated. You know, if I'd, I'd say something like, uh, uh, well, what do we do now, Batman? Oh, we're really in trouble. Bad acting. But you had to do that because they were, they were cells were painted, hand painted. So the mouths couldn't move that fast. Now you could just, now, of course, you know, you start to do something and just, it's at your own pace. You know, what are we going to do now, Batman? Oh, boy, are we in trouble. I mean, that's, it's more, it's more real now. Yeah. I say, even when I did Plastic Man, it's, it, was, it was, I had to sound like somebody in Plastic Man. I had to, I picked, um, uh, what's his name? Um, from the Get Smart series. Oh, what do we do now? Oh, boy, really? Okay, we're in trouble. And I went, oh, that's a good character. What do you mean? Because somebody else invented it. I'll do it. Okay, sure. I don't care. What do I care? (laughs) 
Well, uh, I don't think we're going to hold you hostage much longer here, Michael. Okay. If no, if does yeah. anybody else have anything for uh, Mike before we let him go? Uh, just have you been contacted or heard anything through the rumor mill at all regarding a potential legacy of Kane revival? That's that's almost like seeing Elvis Presley and James Dean having dinner with mm. Mel. Oh. Uh. It ain't gonna happen. Mm. It ain't gonna happen, guys. Somebody said to me, "Would you do that character?" Again? I said, "I'll play his father," but I doubt very seriously they're gonna have me do Raziel again. They'll get somebody young and beautiful. I was like, it's like Rugrats, you know. It's like I auditioned for I audition I often not anymore, but I was auditioning for characters. I auditioned for Transformers for Prowl. I auditioned for when I did uh, uh, Butter for Parquet. I used to go better Parquet, better. I auditioned for that when that came back. I auditioned for the Smurfs, the movies, which I did. I auditioned for the characters I played. I'm auditioning for my career. And I finally said to the agent, this is crazy. Then, you know, it's, what do they have me audition for? I, I tell you, you, you you're you familiar with G.I. Joe at all. I don't know if you're familiar with G.I. Joe. And you know, I do Duke. Duke, yep. yep. And uh, so they were doing, there's a TV series. It's a, um, it was a, a, a live action TV series, a comedy series called Community. Communion, Communion, Communion. I think it's called Communion. And uh, they wanted uh, the lead character in the situation comedy gets hit in the head and has a coma. And when, in the coma, he goes into G.I. Joe land. He becomes animated. And they wanted the voice of Duke. And they said, uh, they called up my agent. They said, we'd like to get Michael Bell, but he's in his 70s. And um, I don't know if he's going to sound like Duke anymore. So can you tell us, can we talk to him? I hate to have him audition, but could you have him give him a call? So she said, all right. She called me. She said, you can hear from the producer. She gave him his name. And he's going to call you probably in about five minutes. And he's going to want to make sure you sound like Duke. He'll give you a couple of lines. You say the lines. I said, okay, fine. And the phone rang. And I picked up the phone and went, hello? And he said, and the voice said, yeah. And he said, uh, yeah. And they said, can I speak to Michael Bell? And I went, oh, yeah. Hold on a second. Grandpa? And I got on the phone. And I went, hello? <laughs> and there was this voice, this silence. And I went, yeah, uh, uh, Michael Bell, please. Yeah, it is Michael. Who's this? <laughs> <laughs> and he went, uh, okay, Michael Bell, who's the voice of Duke and G.I. Joe. Yeah, that's me. Where do you want? <laughs> And there was, and I thought, when's he gonna hang up? So I went, okay, here I am. Yo, Joe, is that okay? No, it's <laughs> half the battle. Is that all right? He went, okay, good. Okay, I'll call your agent back and we'll book the session. And then call back. <laughs> I said to him later on when I met him, I said, you know, my ass may have dropped, but my voice is pretty much the same. And that comes to all of us in the biz, <laughs> unless we're dead. So that's my story. That's my. Uh, that's my that's my that's my redoing. At least, thankfully, they gave it back to me for a while. If you get a chance, to watch Community. It's I think it's called Community or Communion or something. Like that. It's very funny. It's a situation comedy, and that particular one is called GI John or GI Jim, whatever the guy's name. He goes into a coma, and it's really outrageous because it's dirty. It's for adults. So when we kill Destro, we really kill him. <laughs> Somebody goes, you killed him. Nobody dies in crisis. What do you mean? I just, we kill him. You kill Destro. I mean, we really kill him. <laughs> and at one point, I go, when my character walks over to one of the other characters and says, can I ask you a question? And, he's, and I said, and he says, yeah. I said, um, what do boobies look like? <laughs> and the guy goes, huh? You've never seen boobies, real boobies. I said, silly as it is. Because like, you know, they're so clean in cartoons. You're never going to see boobs unless it's... Uh, you know, Adult Swim. So right. it's really funny. Right. And one of the guys comes over. He says, "Can you show me the men's room?" And he says, "How would I know? I've never used one." <laughs> it's a uh, very funny series. I'll have to give that a watch. Thank you, sir. You just made our night. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. Take care. Stay safe. You too. You too.